I mean, no, he'd have been here by ten. Yeah.
Mike Miller called me up this. We'll see if he was here. Hey, good morning, everybody. Bob Paul, anybody new for the really first time? Welcome. Glad you're here. Thank you for being here. <laughs> this is great. Just as just as we love this place pretty soon, we're moving over. Yeah, I know. I'll talk about that in a moment. We're glad you are here. Please uh uh what's your first name? Evelyn. Evelyn, thank you for being here. New to Sun City or just new to us? Thank you for being here. All right. Hey, Bernie May had uh, Bernie May mentioned to me just a minute ago that uh, the uh, Bible translation study, uh, the Bible translation that had been going on, a place we won't name, uh, but tomorrow, tomorrow it, it's been ten years, and tomorrow they're finishing up. We're just checking the last two books of Romans, and that project is entirely complete. Uh, it's been ten years, and a lot of folks in here. A lot of folks in here have been a part of that over the last over the last ten years. So I'm not sure what Bernie has next, but I'm sure he has the next ten years really well planned. So all right, uh, Wednesday morning guys, the uh, Sundays supp supposedly Geneva grabbed me this week. Geneva, our green from Lifestyle, grabbed me this week and said we do have. The lake house for uh, Sundays and Thursdays, starting after the holidays. We're not exactly sure. The screen comes down. We're not exactly sure if the if the audio visual if the audio part is up over there. So we will play that by ear over the next couple of weeks. But we will be moving everything over there Sunday mornings, and we'll start up Thursdays on January 13th over there. We won't meet again on Facebook until January 13th. But by January 13th, we should be completely set up over there uh, because performing arts is over here and uh, choral society and all that. And for the most part, we could have this on Sunday mornings, but there'd be times where we'd be bumped to go over there. So let's just keep it simple, and we will we will uh, we will be meeting over there on Sundays and Thursdays after the holidays. Uh, Julie Goble, where are you? Julie Julie heads up the. Um, Pretty much the Sun City effort for the uh, Bel Air Food Pantry over there, and they had been shopping around for a uh, a used refrigerator, and they uh, they actually got a new one, and uh, and some of the folks in here had helped had also helped out with some of the electrical work and the financing of of that as well. But but if you're interested in, in volunteering with the food pantry, talk to Julie and. Um, and, and, and it's good work over there. It's right over here, you know, and, and so we talked to Julie, but and thanks to the folks who, uh, who helped out with that. And there's other ways to use the funds, and, and they, will, they will use that. Uh, it's just nice to see the folks in here. We have no overhead. So you can use God's money the way God lays on your heart, where your heart is, and where, um, and where, you're, uh, where you choose to serve. And appreciate Julie and all her efforts. Yes, ma'am, you had something else? That it? Good. All right. You're gonna have to take a break when, because they're sending somebody over to turn that disco light off. They gotta get our lighter and go up and turn it off. Tell them forget it. Okay. Yeah, don't. Yeah, tell them don't even bother. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're not taking a break for that. We'll disco before we do that. Yeah. So some of you have seen me dance. I can't dance, and I'm not sure that I would if I could. All right. Uh, Dave Kirby. Dave Kirby's still in the hospital up in Pineville uh, with COVID. Patty Petta also has COVID, by the way. And so Patty's not with us. Amanda and Grunt. David's not here today. Floyd will be teaching the next four Sundays. He was, uh, David was going to be away the next three Sundays anyway. But Amanda's not doing well. Gina's out of town. So Floyd will be uh, teaching today and the next three Sundays. After that, okay. Anything else going on? All right. Songs for this morning. Kind of, it's become sort of a recent classic. The Mary Did You Know, and and, um, and and trying to find a version that's not just some pop singer singing it necessarily, you know. But um, but it's it's hard to find one that 
you know, that, uh, it, but to me, you can't go wrong with a children's choir. So the One Voice Children's Choir will be singing, Mary, did you know? We will be serving uh, the Lord's Supper today. It's at the table right here. So after Floyd, Floyd's going to cut off the teaching at about, at about 11.15, and we'll transition with a communion song that we play. And at that point, if you will, at your table, take care of uh, the, the, the grape juice and the bread at your tables to your, to your folks uh, during that transition. And then Floyd will lead us in the Lord's Supper, and we will close with a medley of Christmas songs. Here we go. Mary, did you know? I love that song. That, that, that's just one great song. You can't, you can't beat that. I'm going to have to move Bob's little notebook here. I'm on. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, surprise. I'm here. Okay. And you've heard why. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have, instead of a three-part series, we're going to have a four-part series of anticipating Christmas through the eyes of Isaiah. Okay? Is this like 
driving on I-40 towards Asheville, and about 40 miles away from Asheville, the mountains are all there, but they just look like they're just stacked up one on top of the other. And then when you get there, you realize there's some valleys in between and some distance between the, the, between the mountain peaks. And that's what Isaiah sees. He sees everything from the coming of Messiah in his birth all the way to his reign in the kingdom. And so when he anticipates the coming of Messiah, he's anticipating all of this. We're going to look at some of these things today as uh, we get into, into our series. Uh, we want to obviously continue to pray for David and uh, David uh, Kirby as well as uh, David Grosk and his family. But why don't we just once more unite our hearts and let's just lift them to the Lord, okay? Because this is a tough time to be at Christmas season and realize how difficult it is for the Ingrassia family especially and the Kirby family at this time. Lord, we do humbly come before you and we thank you for life, for health, for all the things that you've given to us. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are suffering right now, especially uh, David Kirby, especially David and, and uh, Amanda, Amanda uh, Ingrassia. We just ask that you would wrap your loving arms around them, assure them deep in their spirit that you are close to them. And Father, I pray that you would raise them up. I pray that you would use the doctors, and even beyond the doctors, that you would effect a healing in their lives. Give them hope during this time as we anticipate Messiah. Help them, Lord, to sense the hope that they have in you. And may it be a reality in their lives in these uh, coming weeks, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anticipating Christmas through the eyes of Isaiah. You know what? I uh, tell you, this recently uh, I heard on the Business Channel, of all places, to learn something new about Christmas. Okay? On the Business Channel. But every year I try to learn something different about Christmas. Oh, something about a legend. Why is, why is the mistletoe there? You know, why, all this kind of stuff. You know, different things. Why do we do the things that we do around the Christmas season? Look at your sweaters. We ought to have a Sunday of the ugly sweater contest or something. But no, no, no. no. It's like I got rid of mine during the COVID year. <laughs> I got rid of a lot of stuff. So, but this is beautiful. You know, to see the festiveness of the season already coming out. But every year I try to learn something different. And this year, it did come from a newly coined, I don't mean it is 2021 new, but a marketing term that they have coined to explain what's going on now in our culture as we come closer and closer to the holiday season with all of the shortages, with all of the supply chain issues, with all of the gas prices and everything like that, and the stacks of things in the ports. And the phrase is this, pre-parcel anxiety. I mean, this is a new phrase, pre-parcel anxiety. <clears throat> Do you have pre-parcel anxiety? Really, are you worried about your packages arriving too late? <laughs> that's, what's, that's what's happening in our culture. And for many people, as they anticipate the Christmas season, they've got this pre-parcel anxiety. Are you overcome with an anticipation anxiety? Oh, that's a, that's a sad commentary, I think, about this, is it not? But I want it, when I say let's anticipate Christmas, I want us to go back to our childhood. Now, I know not everything in our childhood is pleasant. I know, know that, not for everybody. And maybe there was a Christmas when you were disappointed. I remember one Christmas when I thought I was going to be getting this big slugger baseball bat, you know, and I had all these other Christmas gifts and I didn't get my baseball bat. And, and then, you know, maybe middle of January, mom and dad looked at my sister and I and said, well, did you get everything you wanted for Christmas? And I said, well, I didn't get my baseball bat. And they looked quickly at each other. They realized they'd hid it up in the closet, and they forgot that it was there. <laughs> now, that was a real surprise, you know. But I got the slugger back, even if I wasn't a slugger. But anyway, I got the back. What? Just think back in your own childhood, some of those pleasant memories. I'll take you back 
just a little bit, but first, here are some other reasons why some people are sick of the holidays, David Letterman style. You've got red and green bags under your eyes. That's how you know you're just getting kind of sick of the holidays. You're serving reindeer pot pies. Now you know you're in bad shape if you're doing that. And when you hear sleigh bells ring, are you listening? You scream, no, I'm not listening. Now, I, I, are you feeling that tension? Well, let's just relax. Go back to something pleasant like in our childhood. One of the things that Pam did during the COVID year was she got all the pictures out of all the albums and she found this little system where it has little plastic boxes about the size, you remember the old VCR boxes, uh, VHS tape boxes, and they all go in those suitcases and we have them all now organized by, by decade and even earlier. And so for me to ask her, do you have a picture of your childhood? Right here it is. <laughs> she found it. Pam and Christmas, 1952, four years old. Four years old. Look at that intense look on her face. She and Santa are having a moment right there. Their eyes are fixed. She's looking forward to Christmas. And she's asking Santa. Now, she doesn't even remember what in the world she asked Santa for. She was four years old. But that's the kind of excitement I want us to try to grasp as we get into Isaiah. Whoops. And, uh, well, there's me. 1955. 90, my little sister, she was a year and eight months old. Uh, but me, I, this is Christmas uh, morning, and we're opening up a gift. And, and I, yes, I got my Fanner 50s. Double holsters. My Fanner 50s cap guns. Oh, was I excited. I was going to be just like the Lone Ranger. Do <laughs> you remember that anticipation? What's happened that we've lost it with all the stuff that's piled on Christmas, and we've lost that spirit of anticipation from the Scripture text? Well, that's what we're going to do starting today. Anticipating Christmas through Isaiah's eyes. And the verse that's key for our understanding this morning is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Now we're going to look at this, this verse, we're going to look in its wider context in the Old Testament, and we're going to see how it's used in the New Testament, okay? And see what the Lord is teaching us as we anticipate Christmas through the eyes of Isaiah. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, Emmanuel, we're going to find out in the New Testament, means God with us. Just something, just in case you didn't learn, I, I love little language, little tidbits. Emmanuel, I am, is with in Hebrew. The manu, nu, is us, connected with the preposition with. El is God. Emmanuel, with us, God. With us, God. Can you imagine what anticipation that would have raised in the hearts and minds of true believers even in that day? That's what's going on in this passage. A promise to anticipate. One day, we're going to see the reality of this. One day, the Virgin Mary had a baby boy, as we heard say this, this morning. Mary, did you know? Now, that's where it's going. But remember... There's a lot of those mountain peaks that are kind of smushed together in Isaiah's vision. And what you have is some things in this prophecy, in its context, that are really going to be fulfilled in the days of Isaiah, but not the pure understanding of the word virgin. That's going to be later. But the current circumstances are going to be very, very similar to the days of Isaiah. Well, let's look at it. Let's look at the context of this prophecy. So there, earlier in chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, if we understand the context, I believe, then we'll be able to understand uh, what it is, in fact, that Isaiah is pointing to with this prophecy. And that's what I want you to grasp today. Isaiah 7, 2 and 3, you see, there, Israel is the ten tribes the nation, 12 tribes were divided. You remember that? They had a split. They had a civil war after Solomon. Split the nation. Ten tribes in the north called Israel. Two tribes in the south called Judah. Judah, Benjamin. 
was called Judah. Syria is the country right north of Israel, even to this day. And here this prophecy says, when the house of David, the royal family of David, was told Syria is in league with Ephraim. Ephraim is another way of saying Israel. The heart of Ahaz, now he's the king of Judah, the one in the south. He's of the royal family. And the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And the Lord said to Isaiah, go out to meet Ahaz. Now go down there where the aqueduct comes out there and where they go over there and they wash their clothes. But he's going to pass through that way and I want you to go over there and give him a word of encouragement. He's a prophet. So he is going to give a word of encouragement to Ahaz. Look what he says there in verses 4 and 5. And say to him, be careful, be quiet, calm yourself. Don't, do not fear, don't be afraid. <clears throat> And do not let your heart be faint. Now you see what those were? Those were little short commands, but they were intended to say, take a breath. Yes, you're under attack. But the Lord has made a promise to your forefather, David. And he said that there would always be someone from the line of David sitting on the throne. So take a breath. God is going to keep his promise. God's going to keep his word. Don't be afraid. Don't let your heart be faint because of the fierce anger of reason. That was the king of Syria and Syria and the son of Remaliah. Now, Pekah was the king of Israel, and so he's the son of Remaliah. Because Syria with Ephraim, that is Israel, and the son of Remaliah, that is the king of Israel, had devised evil against you, saying, and here's what they said, let us go against Judah and terrify it. Now what a thought. Let's just go and just bully them to the place that they are horrified and they're cringing. Terrify it. And let us conquer it for ourselves. Ah. Land grab. Land grab. And let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. Uh-oh. They want to destroy the house of David. They want to destroy the royal family and set up another king who will be in league with them. You see what's going on? That's the context of 714. Let's do this. <clears throat> and that scared the pants off of King Ahaz, all right? The plot to destroy the royal house of David. It's a sad day. Isaiah 7, verses 7 to 9, thus says the Lord. Now here's the encouraging word coming. If, or it, it, that is their evil plot. It shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. Do you see the encouraging word from the prophet Isaiah? It's not going to happen. It won't happen. But, he says in verse 9, if you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. If you don't stand strong in your faith, you won't stand strong. Doesn't matter your military might. Doesn't matter your political shenanigans. Trying to get the Assyrians to come and back you up against Syria and Israel. You're going to get the Assyrians over there in Iraq to come over and be your helper. You're going to call for Egypt to come up. This is all in the wider context. And you're going to get all these people to come up <clears throat> so that you can have peace and safety in your time. But if you don't have faith in the Lord, if you don't have faith in the Lord's promise, you won't have faith at all. You won't stand. Now that was the word of Isaiah. So how did he confirm it? Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz through Isaiah. And he says, ask a sign. A sign. Now that's key. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, clear down to hell, as high as the heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. That's really phony baloney hypocrisy. We'll see here in a second. Isaiah said, ask whatever you want. I mean, to hell and to heaven. You know what that means? Just make it as difficult a sign as you can think of. 
Make it a mind blower. Make it one that just, just blows everybody away. It's so impossible to think that God would do it. And he said, no, I don't want to do that. See, he's not really putting his faith in the Lord. And so Isaiah says, and he, but Isaiah said, okay, hear then, O house of David. Now you see how house of David, the royal family, is always in the context. Two key phrases we've seen multiple times here. Sign, house of David, that's important, see, the royal family. Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. You know what a sign? God will give you a sign. And here's one to blow your mind. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God with us. That's the sign. Now, the Lord has done many things in history. He has helped a woman like a Hannah who was barren and is feeling put upon by her husband's other wife, and she was having kids just one after another after another, and Hannah didn't have any child, and she begged, and God rolled back her barrenness and allowed her to have a child. That's a, that's a miracle. Even more than that, you remember Sarah, way past the age of having children. Even Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, way past the time to have children. And the Lord enabled those two women to have a child. And it's not too big a leap to understand that the Lord is going to say here, he can even take a virgin woman and allow her to have a child. You're afraid that the house of David is going to be exterminated? You're afraid if they kill you, it'll snip the, the, the line to the kings? The Lord can raise up a promised heir to the Davidic throne, even through a virgin without you. That's the sign. That's the sign. Now, there might have been something minor in Isaiah's day, it says. It could very well be because chapter 8 seems to look like Isaiah uh, had another little boy, and that was a sign to Israel in that time. But it wasn't the complete fulfillment of this, as we're going to see later on in the text. So, when we come over then this Isaiah context and understand it, in the 8th century world, Political conspiracy just filled the air with dangers and intrigue, and they were all around. The same set of circumstances exist in the first century when Jesus is going to be born. Dangers all around. When the wise men came, you remember, came right up to Herod's palace, said they're looking for the one who was born king of the Jews. What did Herod want to do? He devised a little plot that the, the Lord told wise men to get out of town, and then Herod and his Anger that is beyond belief gives order to kill all the baby boys in the region that are two years old and younger. Horrible man. Horrible man. You see, this is a dangerous world in which Jesus was born. It's a dangerous world today. It's always been. We're looking forward to the time when the one that the Lord promised from Mary, the Virgin Mary, that one will reign forever and bring us peace. The word out there yet. So let's look then at the New Testament and what the New Testament says. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. You know, only Matthew and Luke have birth accounts. Only Matthew and Luke. And both Matthew and Luke have genealogies because that's important to know who's in the line, right? Who's in the royal line. And so here after the genealogy, Matthew 1:18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together. It, it telegraphs it to us that she was a virgin. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And it even tells us the source, the Holy Spirit, in England. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, Boy, he didn't want to turn her loose on a culture that would really make it bad for her to have to live after that. So he, he decides to sort of make it a secret divorce and, and we'll just kind of, well, it didn't work out, you know, things. No, while he's thinking about these things, he wanted to divorce her quietly 
But as is considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not... Son of David? See, Joseph is in the royal line. But we're going to see that there's going to be different sons of David. And the son of David through David and Solomon, which is in the Matthew genealogy. David, Solomon, right on down. That's where Joseph's line is. But go over there to Luke. Luke we'll see it in a second. It goes... David, Nathan, and on down. When the Lord so put the clamps down on this side of the royal family, he did an end run right back to David's son, this guy over here, and this is where Mary's going to come from. And so it's a blessed life. Well, here, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Then Luke, look what Luke adds. Luke the physician, in his sixth month of, that is of Elizabeth's pregnancy with baby John the Baptist, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin, spells it out. Betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. There we go, the royal family thing, I can't see. And the virgin's name was Mary. Now this is where the details if you just believe the text, this is how it explains it. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Son of Saul Matthew. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And that's the kicker. The sign virgin conceiving, and it's relating to the house of David. This is how God's going to keep his word, his promise to David, that there would always be someone who would be on the throne. That's how it's going to come about. So the text goes on, and Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Virgin, don't you leave it. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and this is as far down into the details that the Lord gives. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. <coughs> That's how you'll be enabled. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. You see, this is a different child. This is what makes Jesus unique. Back to our Matthew passage. The angel said to Joseph, She will bear a son, and you'll call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua, which means salvation. And Jesus will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Now we're tying it back to Isaiah 7. Behold, the virgin shall conceive. Now, do you notice every time we read this, it said, the virgin? That's why I say there might be some possible understandings in a given local context, near context, but when you get there, you realize it's not all fulfilled there. There's another mountain peak out in the future, and this is this one right here, the virgin. There's a specific, the virgin, and that's the virgin Mary. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. So whereas back in Isaiah's day, it might have been a sign that God's on our side. God's with us. God's with us. As if they were cheering. God's with us. God's with us. Possibly. But when you get to the New Testament, you're going to call his name Emmanuel. He's holy, the Son of God. God is with us. See, that's the fuller meaning of that passage. Let's see if we can pull some things together here today. Now, you know that we are pointing here to the Lord's Supper. But remember, <laughs> Isaiah sees the coming of Messiah at his birth, but also his mission. We're going to look at that some other weeks. And what we've got is this one came and was born because he was going to die. And we're going to be celebrating his humanity, his broken body, his Poured out blood. That's what we celebrate here as we think of what Jesus did in his death 
so that we could have the forgiveness of our sins. Sign purpose. How important is that? Well, the virgin birth is evidence, if you will, of the uniqueness of Messiah. Uniqueness. This is, a, this is not like any other just miraculous birth through natural human means. This is something special. Now what we're seeing here is that this uniqueness doesn't mean that God created an embryo and then implanted it into Mary. That would have snipped the line of David. It would have been the, the line of David. The Lord really uses her humanity. The Holy Spirit overshadows her and enables her to be the one who conceived one who is fully human and divine at the same time. You see that? That's what we're saying. And so what you've got here, and it's not that like some denominations teach it, God the Father came and had sexual intercourse with Mary, and that's where Jesus came from. Oh, that's not right. That's not true at all. Check it out. I won't tell you who. But well, there's a denomination that really believes that. That's not true. This is through the humanity is through Mary. The deity is from the Holy Spirit. And Mary is a sign that God is going to fulfill his word about the Davidic promise. The sinless nature. This is a guarantee that he was called holy. The virgin birth is evidence of his worthiness. He is the Savior, Jesus. He is Messiah Jesus, the anointed one to be king. He is the Savior Jesus, the one who came to die in our place to, so our sins could be forgiven. His nature is the one that's sinless. You see, we read in Luke where, how can this be? And he said, well, it's because the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, and therefore he will be called holy. He's called holy because the Holy Spirit is the one who enables Mary, who said at another place, my soul, my soul rejoices in God, my Savior. She knew she needed a Savior. But the Holy Spirit is the one that enabled her to conceive a son who was holy by the Holy Spirit. The Immaculate Conception is about Jesus, not about Mary. As some denominations teach. Sinless, sovereign power. Sovereign power. Here we have, if you will, the virgin birth is evidence of God's power and control over all of nature. Now think about that. Just as we've mentioned how that he could help barren women have children and even those past their age, to, past the menopause to have children and now he's enabling a virgin to have a child. This is in fact, see this is in fact something that teaches us that God is all powerful. Everything is under his control in nature. Salvation is the goal in all of our passages. The virgin birth is evidence that salvation is supernatural and fully the gift of grace. Fully the gift of grace. Nothing by our works. Just like Ahaz could not have done anything to keep himself and his kingdom safe. Isaiah was trying to bolster this man's faith. But God is the one who steps in. You remember in the days of Hezekiah, because that's going to be his son who's going to be reigning when the Assyrians attack and the Lord is going to preserve Israel because Hezekiah had faith in what God could do. You see, salvation is the goal. The Lord is the one that, through his grace, is the one who delivers us. Conclusion, the virgin birth is evidence that God can do the impossible. You know, that's what the angel told Mary. After all that discussion, after answering her question, the angel says, don't forget, for nothing will be impossible with God. So to deny the virgin birth is to deny the God of the Bible. That's why the virgin birth is so important. Yes, Christmas is about the birth, and yes, it's what Jesus did when he died and rose again. That's the basis for our salvation. But can I say, it's because of who Jesus is that he can do what he does. Who he be is what enables what he do. The be is before the do. He is God in the flesh, and that's why when he dies on the cross, 
His, ato his atonement, his payment is not just one man dying. This is God in the flesh dying, appeasing everything that God held out against us humans of Adam's seed because we, in fact, have violated his law. And Jesus took it all on himself and paid the price. How can he do that? Because he's God in the flesh by means of the virgin birth. See, that's what's the important thing. Do you believe in God's Son? Uniquely God with us who came to save us from our sins. John put it this way, simply, just to get to underscore the deity in humanity. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, Jesus is the Son who is the Word. And he's the one who does all the creating. It says in the following verses, but down in verse 14, and the Word became flesh. That eternal one, the Word, who was with God in eternity, Father, Son, Spirit, co-equal, the Word had a mission. The Word became flesh. That's through the virgin birth. That's the, the teaching of the Scriptures. That's why it's important to reaffirm Isaiah's anticipation of what's coming. That's the meaning of Christmas for us Christians. Don't back away from it. Don't be deceived by all the glitz and glamour and goo and gulp that goes on at Christmas time, but get to the heart and remember the Virgin Mary had a baby boy, and that baby boy was going to be the one who died for our sins and rose again, and is going to come again to fulfill God's ancient promise in about 1000 B.C. that David would always have one. As a matter of fact, the son of David in that line will be the one who will reign over all the world. And Jesus is coming back one day to do just that. So as we turn our attention to the Lord's Supper, we're going to have Bob come, and he is going to... Uh, give us a song here um, while he is getting things ready. Let me remind you when, when we, we're going to, this is the song we're going to sing when we all stand up right here. Okay. Sure. What we'll do is we're going to stand to sing this song. And I'd like, like to ask someone in your table there to just help people pour the, pour the juice and make sure everybody has the elements. But we're going to stand to sing. And if for some reason you don't feel comfortable taking the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper with us, you're welcome to leave during the song, okay? It's not, it's not required. But remember, remember that this is the communion of the body of Christ. And we're an expression of that body right here. And so you're welcome. You're welcome. If you're a believer. You're welcome to the Lord's table. And so we're going to stand here just a minute. You just tell me, Bob, when you get it yep. together. Together. It is? Yep. All right. Well, let's all stand. We'll sing this song. And if you need to leave, you're, you're welcome to leave. We'll sing a song, prepare the elements there at your table for people around the table. Then we'll sit back down and we'll have the communion together. Let's sing.
times we refer to the fact that this is a sign of our bond together. See, if we just extended what we learned this morning, not only is Jesus the promised seed of David, and he will be the one who is the heir of the world, but you and I who belong to Jesus are bound to him. And that makes us heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And that's what we celebrate through his, through his blood. So if everyone has uh, the elements there before them, take the bread, please, and just remember this. Jesus said to his disciples, this bread, this bread is my body given for you. Eat all of it. Thank you, Lord, for the, shed, for the, the broken body of our, our Savior. Thank you, Father that you have done this for us in a way that we can never do for ourselves. We thank you for your grace in Jesus' name. And now taking the cup, our Lord said, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. Drink you all. Again, Father, we thank you that you've brought us together as your body in the new covenant, awaiting the day when your son, the covenant maker, comes to take his rightful place on the throne over all the nations of the world. Until that time, Father, we look forward to being your light in this world, no matter how dark it is. Help us, Father, to truly be the light that shines for the true meaning of Christmas through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have some songs here before we're dismissed. You all have a great week coming up. But let's sing together. This is a, a Christmas medley uh, to close with. And, and I, I'm going to share with you a, a quick story of a guy I know here in Sun City, you know, who knows who I am. And, and we've been acquainted since friends for a few years we talking to him on the phone the other day and he said he said Bob you know I'm an atheist I said yeah I, I know you're an atheist he said but you know what I wish you Christians would do he said I really wish you guys would put the Christ back in Christmas he said you argue about the lights at the front of the community and he said with all of this commercialism he said it'd be so nice if you Christians would just put Christ back in Christmas in Christmas Good thought. Anyway. Oh, come all ye faithful.
I think, I think Paul back there is the only one who can hit that harmony bass. <laughs> it's just marvelous to sit. If you're sitting back there and hearing him sing, it, it is wonderful. But it's funny when you see, um, and, and some of you guys are going to remember this, you know, it, it's interesting seeing Floyd with the cap guns. <laughs> but after you guys, after you shot caps, a few, what did my parents, my dad was a career Marine, so kind of, we had no rules. Everything just went. You know, but he would buy me caps in bulk. Remember they came in the rolls? And I would sit in the driveway with a hammer and an entire roll of caps. And you can blow all 50 caps with a hammer at one time, which is probably why in my early 40s I had hearing aids. But there was nothing more fun than just banging a whole roll of caps with, uh, with a hammer. And my parents just, they just let us do it, you know, whatever. Remember that? Because some of the concrete would even fly up and get rocks and stuff. And, you know, parents these days are soft. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Cheryl and I will be here next week. Floyd's going to be next, the next three weeks. Um, I hope we do indeed put uh, Christ in Christmas to the community. Father, we ask your blessing on us as a people, as your people. Uh, we were, may we remember you and when we walk about. Um, in, um, among in the community, the, the, the community are, are the people here. As we walk about in our community, may we indeed uh, be the presence of your kingdom. As we go about, may people see indeed that we are different in a good way, in a good way, that we do indeed love you, we love each other, and we are working for the benefit of this community here. Glorify yourself through us, we ask in your name. Amen. Thanks for being here. Barbara, Barbara Vey was the one that actually made the bread that we had today. Now Barbara Vey made that bread. Thank you, Barbara.